Let's talk about Simply Music and our relationship to teaching students how to read music. This is somewhat of a, well, it's been somewhat of a public debate over the last 20 years because we're an organisation that staunchly stands by the premise of delaying the reading process for beginning students. The model that we adopt, just like as little children, we hear our family and the world that we're in, we hear people speak. After a while, we begin to emulate the speech, we begin to babble, the babble becomes words, the words start to formulate, they start to be built together, we start to construct sentences. We're three, four, five years of age, we've got a really comprehensive ability to speak and, and comprehend and communicate. And then we learn how to read and spell. After we've acquired a very developed and comprehensive self-expression in speech. Now, it's quite common for people to say music is a language. You'll hear people say music is the universal language. And yet when it comes to the teaching of music, it's as if we put that aside and we no longer continue to treat music like a naturally occurring self-expression. It's a languaging that's innate to everybody. We stand by that and we staunchly defend that premise the critical importance of delaying music reading in the early stages. Let's, as we do with speaking, where we develop a vocabulary and a communicative ability and then introduce spelling, likewise, let's get students playing. Let's get them playing lots of music, lots of great sounding music, contemporary and classical and gospel and blues and jazz and ballads and arrangements and improvising, composing, lots and lots of stuff and with this really comprehensive foundation of playing. Then, when you introduce the reading process, particularly the way that we introduce it, it's a completely different experience. The students are now seeing that something represented on the page, oh, I see, this is a symbolic representation of that which I can already do. And it makes a world of difference uh, throughout the process. So, firstly, we delay music reading. Secondly, when we introduce it, we introduce music reading differently. So in order to understand differently, I just want to talk momentarily about the conventional approach. Now, this is literally a conventional approach. I'm saying there are lots of teachers who no longer teach this way. Uh, generally speaking, there, there are more and more educators who are moving towards an intervallic approach to music reading, which I think is the you know, way of the future. But the way in which it's been done in the past, for all of those students that had lessons in the past, many, many of you who are watching this video will remember face, F-A-C-E, or all cows eat grass, or every good boy deserves fudge, uh, say here in America or in Australia, we, we, it was every good boy deserves fruit. This little acronym, this mnemonic approach of being able to learn how to read. So let me just go over to a diagram and just represent what I'm talking about for those of you who don't know, just so you can be on the same page. And I'll also point to some of the inherent problems with the conventional mnemonic acronym approach. Let's go over to the page. So I have just a standard set of lines representing sheet music. And what we know is that every note on the piano instrument can be represented somewhere here, in some way here on the page. I'm just going to draw in a couple of familiar symbols. And to make it even easier, I'll just bring the lid down. So, what happens in a traditional environment, we might learn that the notes that go in here correspond with the letters F, A, C, E. And that's good because that spells the word face. So we have an acronym there. We'd also discover that these notes here that are on the lines, E, G, B, D, F, well, that doesn't help us so much from a spelling point of view, but we might be able to say, well, every good boy deserves fruit or fudge. And now we've got this system of being able to remember the notes that are written on the lines and in the spaces. However, here's the problem. Let's just stay with me on the page. I've shown you a system that allows you to read the notes in this region, and that system was F-A-C-E and every good boy deserves fruit or fudge. But that no longer applies when we start to get up into the notes, you know, up here in the ledger lines. We need a different mnemonic altogether. It no longer helps us in the lower ledger lines. We need a different mnemonic. 
it no longer helps us above the ledger lines on the base clef, nor does it help us in the base clef, and nor does it even help us in the ledger lines below the base clef. So really, one, two, three, four, five, six, we're dealing with potentially with six different domains. And what we see consistently, even at the level of highly advanced, in some instances, professional musicians, I've even seen this at the level, at the orchestra level performance, where those notes that are way up in the upper ledger lines and way down in the lower ledger lines, very often what people have to do is they have to count their way up. E, G, B, D, F, okay, I'm at F, now it's F, G, B, A, C, D, it's an E. And they'll count their way up and then maybe pencil in the E note there. Okay, well that's a way of working around it, but it still never leaves people with an immediacy and a freedom and an ease in being able to deal with the extremities. What happens in our program is we have quite a different approach. And the outcome is significantly different. First of all, I want you to know that we use an intervallic approach, which is n not unique to us. There are lots of programs that use an intervallic approach. The second thing is, is that we begin with rhythm, the reading of rhythm, not the reading of pitch or which notes to play. The reason we do that is because without question, the average person can very quickly and very easily and very immediately connect with the natural rhythm. When you demonstrate it, they can connect with, oh yeah, I can see that when I'm walking, I've got a natural rhythm there. And when people have got some experienced representation of something that we're going to represent in symbols, it helps them enormously. So we can draw on the existing physicality that people have as a means of developing their relationship with rhythm. In the early stages, we just start by identifying three simple ingredients, quarter notes, eighth notes, and sixteenth notes. And within one lesson, we can have total beginners who've never read before, who've never seen a quarter or an eighth or a sixteenth note, be able to put together, read, and be clapping in a smooth, even, and rhythmical fashion, complex rhythmical sentences. This can happen over a lesson, maybe two lessons, but very commonly within one lesson. It's quite remarkable. When it comes to reading pitch, we start our students reading four ledger lines above the treble clef, four ledger lines below the bass clef. So looking at our diagram, we start down here and up here. Because what we have found with, with a very simple approach, one simple language has five components. That five, those five components map perfectly onto the fingers. Those same five components map perfectly onto the keyboard. Those same, same five components, not only do they map perfectly to the page, but they're able to, they give us ease, access, and fluency in being able to read all of the notes in each of those six regions that I talked about earlier, where ordinarily we'd need their own separate acronym. So it's very, very easy. Another distinguishing factor in our reading process is the fact that this is a generative approach as compared to a receptive approach. Let me just distinguish the two. All human beings have both a receptive and a generative ability. Our receptive ability is the ability to receive instructions. Our generati generative ability is the ability to generate that for ourselves. We are, we are naturally biased towards our receptive ability, more so than our generative ability. And what I mean by that is you'll often find, say, a child who's born into a bilingual family where a second language is spoke, spoken. Very often that child will say, well, I can understand French, but I can't speak it. And you think, well, how can you understand it? Well, understanding is receptive and our ability to be able to quantify and correlate and process at a receptive level is different than what's needed at a generative level. We'll often see musicians that are really accomplished musicians and they can read a very complex score. But if I speak out a complex rhythm, da 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 their ability to write that, even though if I put it in front of them already, they could read it, the ability to write it, oftentimes they're struggling. What we have found is there's a direct correlation between generative development and receptive ability. Meaning, if you start teaching students how to write music where they're having to generate it from the very beginning. This has an enormous impact, an exponential impact on their ability to receive instructions. So how you develop strong readers is to develop strong writers. The, the additional mm, advantage that we draw on is that from the beginning our students have been immersed in a playing based environment. They've been immersed in learning a way of learning. 
They've been immersed in developing the lens that allows them to see structure, shape, patterns, correlations, cross-referencing, cross-pollinating. The ability to take pieces of music and develop levels of sophistication, all of this comes into play when our students then step into the generative approach to learning how to read. That point of view that they've developed allows them to start to recognize shapes and patterns on the page. It starts them allowed, it allows them to be able to see structure on the page. It allows them to be able to identify components of the music that are otherwise perhaps more difficult to recognize as being the same. Our students can see correlations and similarities because of the grounding that they've had in a playing based foundation. So, for the record, we are absolute staunch supporters of people being able to read music. Reading would be brilliant, and who would want a world where people could only speak language and not read language? At the same point in time, who would want a world where people could only read books but not speak? Well, in some respects, we deal with a lot of that in the world of music. A world of musicians, and I have no doubt that there are people watching this video now who know that they have the ability to read at a sophisticated level or a comprehensive level or even at an intermediate or beginner level, but if I take the music away, they can play nothing. And that would be the equivalent of being only able to speak if I was reading from a script. And we don't want that. You don't want that. What we want is a comprehensive foundation, students playing a broad array of great sounding music covering a whole variety of styles. And one of our core goals being in Simply Music that we develop students who have the ability to self-generate, meaning they have everything they need to be able to go online, buy some music, download it, read the music, extract the information, lay it out on the keyboard, see all the shapes and structure and patterns, claim it for themselves, so everywhere they go they take their music with them and it's not reliant and dependent on the page. It's critically important. We're staunch supporters of music reading, our approach is unique, the results are wonderful, there you have it.